you know, my story actually really began a lot farther back than I even realized, right? Mm. I thought about in the midst of my illness and, and went down the rabbit hole of education and, and scouring, you know, literature and, you know, you know, collaborating with doctors and researchers and scientists. But, you know, basically like, like, like so many people who end up very, very chronically ill, especially as chronically ill as I ended up at such an early age. Um, I ended up with one of these unexplainable syndrome-based illnesses. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Mini in the house. All right. <laughs> I appreciate that. The carnivore diet. Because of the heat. Honestly, you've really touched my heart. So Fast Like a Girl, it's ready for pre-order now. I hope this book changes your life the way the information has changed hundreds of thousands of women that have applied it. From the bottom of my heart, enjoy and let's get healthy together. I have so many questions about kava, so uh, I want to jump into it. Um, and I think I want to go back to your story. I'm sure you've told your story a thousand times. Um, but it's a really important one because I think a lot of people can gleam some hope from it. Uh, so take us back because you, you know, I'm talking to you now, looking at you, you're like super vibrant to me. You look really healthy. That's the only Cameron that I know. But this wasn't the, the teenage or 20 year old version of you, was it? Very different. Yeah. Night and day. I mean, as different as different can be, right? You know, me yep. at my absolute worst uh, compared to who you're looking at now. It's just it profound transformation. It's really sort of realigned my sense of the possible, right? Of what mm -hmm. actually is possible. It changes everything. It's, it, this whole process has dissolved so many boundaries for me, you know, you know, physically, psychologically, and emotionally, right? Um, and sort of, you know, giving me a glimpse into just human potential um, in general. But really, you know, my story actually really began a lot farther back than I even realized, right? Mm. I thought about in the midst of my illness and, and went down the rabbit hole of education and, and scouring, you know, literature and, you know, you know, collaborating with doctors and researchers and scientists. But, you know, basically like, like, like so many people who end up very, very chronically ill, especially as chronically ill as I ended up at such an early age. Um, I ended up with one of these unexplainable syndrome based illnesses um, that it, it, it's not really unexplainable. We call it unexplainable, but it's really not. It's just, it's difficult to explain. It doesn't mm -hmm. fit, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't fit into the sort of peg of the, um, of the, you know, standard sort of allopathic framework or set mm -hmm. of descriptions, right? That we talk yeah. about, we look at one set of symptoms as one disease process so that we can give a corresponding medication. When you have a syndrome, it basically means it's like a continuum. It's an underlying disease process. And you can, you literally have so many different, you know, sort of symptom clusters coming to the surface across the board, neurological symptoms, immunological symptoms, gut symptoms, because at the end of the day, what I experience and what so many people are experiencing now today um, is just, you know, sort of a complete systematic breakdown mm. of, of your entire biology, which can, you know, be contributed to by any number of different environmental factors mixed with probably a genetic susceptibility, you know, across the board too, right? This gene environment interaction that happens yep. that leads to what we always call the perfect storm um, yep. where, you know, you get, you know, you have the right susceptible genes maybe, or maybe the right sort of childhood traumas, either emotional traumas or physical traumas, or mom had a mouthful of a mercury of, 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 of amalgam uh, mercury fillings or, you know, you, you know, toxins that were handed down or, you know, you know, a set of, you know, far too many vaccinations for your genetic framework or whatever, these things all come together and they fill up your metaphorical stress bucket. What, you know, you and I know, and, and we've all talked about a million times as being, um, you know, every person has a metaphorical stress bucket and, you know, every single stress that you experience throughout the course of your life is like a drop in the bucket, physical, chemical, emotional, and some people have genetically smaller buckets than others, right? So yep. I definitely, in retrospect, not knowing at the time, but I was someone who definitely had a smaller bucket. I was going to say, so do you have a small bucket? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's as far as all the, the, you know, the data that we've been able to gather and just looking at retrospectively, like getting as sick as I got, I did have some overwhelming stressors in my life. But so do many other people that I know that don't get or haven't gotten anywhere near as sick as I got, right? Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, if, if I look sort of back at my, at my childhood, I had, you know, a few different big emotional stressors. I had, um, uh, you know, some big, big, big 
chemical stressors. I had, you know, a mouthful of amalgam fillings and my mom had a mouthful of amalgam fillings. And, you know, we were in a you know situation with a moldy home, you know, early on in my life and then later on in my life as well, too. So we had a lot of different physical things that were going on, um, which sort of led me at a very early age to sort of develop one of these sort of hyper impulsive personalities, which is which usually is a byproduct of some sort of metabolic or um, you know, emotional psychological deficit, meaning that you're trying to compensate for mm -hmm. brain chemistry that's not there. So you're trying to stimulate yourself from the external environment you know, through this dopamine pleasure loop thing, you know, either it be through impulsive eating or you know, you know, becoming a, a, you know, sort of like an adrenaline, uh, you know, junkie. At an early yes. Thing, so. uh, you were like an extreme uh, athlete. Yes. Yeah, I was. And that, and that came later on. It started in my early teens. Whenever you're a kid, um, I already, I was, I was sort of wired this way and it wasn't to a level at which you would say, oh, there's severe problems with that kid or anything like that. And that's kind of the problem, right? Is that it didn't, it wasn't severe enough to where I was like, I could put it, you put one of these severe boxes which, you know, thank God I didn't actually, because I probably would have been heavily medicated had that been, you know, the, you know, the uh, situation and things could have gone even worse. But I wasn't, but I did get to a certain age uh, where I was in a situation where I was highly impulsive across the board, um, you know, both with my, my, my eating habits, obviously my activities and got it, you know, very, very hardcore into, um, endurance sports at a pretty early age. And that sort of became my sort of addiction outlet. I was always looking for the most responsive or the responsible way to, uh, you know, to sort of direct my impulsivity or my, my yeah. addictions. Um, and, you know, for a small period of time, I got into drugs and alcohol, like in a, you know, you know high school years, but quickly got into some, some gnarly territory oh, there, okay. shifted out of that and just kind of put everything back into my sports, my work, you know, I was working three jobs, uh, you know, late high school, early college. It was, I was, I was running at the, at the NCAA level for cross country and track. And I was a, an elite marathon runner and eventually ran professionally and all this stuff. And so I was very extreme on that side of things, which, mm. which honestly, I, it led me to develop a really abusive relationship with exercise and activity and with working out, um, which actually filled up my bucket even more. I mean, you know, distance running is absolutely, or just oh, yeah. is absolutely a double-edged sword. I mean, there's a way in which you can derive some benefit, but when you don't uh, allow for adequate recovery and, or you start to pile on enormous amounts of miles, uh, you know, in the way that I was doing, especially with the dietary habits that I had and the lack of sleep and the staying up late and the Taco Bell four times a day, like as a yep. freshman in college, like, you know, it's just, you know, you don't think about those things and my generation didn't. Because I, you know, in, you know, and I grew up in a part of the country too, that we didn't have any access to any kind of like functional medicine, sort of more progressive. Where'd you grow uh, up? I grew up in Arkansas. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's kind of in the South. So it's definitely not in the more sort of progressive sort of cutting edge, you know, you know, philosophical uh, yeah. you know, part of the country when it comes yeah. to like, you know, the thinking, right. Meaning that, you know, most things that move forward, obviously start from the coast and come in, you know, to some degree, at least, especially like with health that you see you know, people moving, you know, towards a more sort of, um, uh, you know, causality based medical approach instead of mm -hmm. like you know, your classic family doctor, you know, allopath treat the symptoms. Yeah. And what that was college, all what call, yeah. What college were you at? I was at the university of Arkansas, U of A. Oh, okay. So you were, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Cause you're, cause you're already, your story already sounds very similar to mine. I was at university of Kansas, uh, mm -hmm. as a tennis player, I was on a tennis yeah. scholarship there. Same thing. Just it, it's exercise gone wrong. You know, yeah. it's extreme when you, when you have to compete at that high level, it, it beats your nervous system down. And it, we have so much glorification of our extreme athletes. And we think that fitness, it, you, there's no way to overdo fitness, but you, there's a perfect yeah. example. Well, and especially when part of your drive that led you into that extreme level of fitness was a deficit that you're trying to compensate for. Yeah. Right? And so you're sort of like overstimulating a system that's already, that's already overstimulated, right? That's already like, you're trying to amp up yourself with adrenaline and dopamine to compensate for an energy deficit in your body. And I did that both through, you know, the, the mechanical stimulation of exercise and other things um, but also through, you know, the high, high use of stimulants 
you know, I started at an early age with everything from coffee to everything that was available to mm. me over the counter, like from GNC, these kind of like amphetamine derivatives that are in these pre, you know, these pre-workout. That's products. ironic because now you're doing kava. Yeah, which is exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It Funny how life goes. Some pretty severe problems. So I always <laughs> migrated even whenever I, you know, fell into drugs and alcohol for short periods of time, always migrated towards stimulants because I was in a metabolic deficit where low energy was always my problem. My system, you know, whenever you become hyperimpulsive, you start being, you know, sympathetically dominant and that burns mm -hmm. out the system like from the inside out. Right. Yeah. So, so did you have a break? Did you have like a breakdown moment? Absolutely. Yeah. So it all sort of came to a head when I was piling more and more and more. It's like the more tired and fatigued that I got, which, you know, progressively this sort of happened over a number of years in my childhood and, and, you know, whenever I got tired, I just thought I was weak. I just thought it was a moral failing. So yeah. it led me to like this sort of identity crisis of trying to push harder to prove to myself that I wasn't. And I didn't have anyone around me to sort of explain this process to me of how the body works, how it makes energy, yeah. that you know, whenever I'm taking stimulants, all I'm doing is borrowing from tomorrow to pay for today. And I really need to be refilling the bank account instead of charging credit, you know. Mm, well you said. The symbolism there, yeah. So I ended up just, you know, you know, once I got committed to that level of athletics, which is actually pretty amazing that I was able to function at the level that I was, you know, being at, at the level that I was and running in college and professionally and was hitting, you know, I qualified, you know, you know, for the Olympic trials whenever I was in, uh, you, you know, for the marathon and stuff, which is very wow. kind of stuff. Um, but I got more and more invested in that across the board. And then I was willing to do anything that I had to do to keep performing, even though I was becoming progressively more depleted over time. I eventually just crashed and I would crash periodically. And then I would have to, you know, you know, take a step back and just go into my little cave and recover for a few weeks and then, you know, and then go back out. But eventually my system crashed and I was not recovering from it. And I just fell into, I got like two or three injuries at once because my, my training level just went to a level that I, I got knee injuries plus just, you know, adrenal exhaustion. The body couldn't keep up. Yes, exactly. I, I was totally depleted um, when I was sort of at my peak and I was only about 20, 21 at this time. Still in college, the middle of getting my undergrad, all that stuff was working multiple jobs. And at, at this time I was running 150 to 180 miles a week wow. so, and they were hard miles. It was, so it was it was not good. Um, but so I ended up totally crashing what I thought was a total crash, which actually wasn't near what I ended up at. And I ended up highly desperate. I sought out the counsel of everyone around me, the trainers, the coaches, the everything. And they didn't know anything, you know, besides just performance, how to get you to perform tomorrow, like what to give. Oh you. yeah. So I ended up in a psychiatrist's office, long story short, uh, I was prescribed a plethora of different medications, the primary one being Adderall, amphetamine-based drug, which is obviously, oh. is going to get you back out there. Uh, yeah. Did they have you, did you have a di did you have a diagnosis? Like, did they say you are oh, this? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Of course. And it, it, it's not all it's, they just diagnose you based on symptom clusters. They're not like right. doing a blood test, a brain scan. I mean, there are some great sort of functional psychiatrists that are doing actual spec brain scans and things, which I ended up doing later on, aiming clinics, people like that. But standard allopathic sort of psychiatrists, they just look at you, they hear what you say. Oh, you're tired. Oh, you have trouble focusing. Okay. ADHD, here you go. Interesting. What so, year was this? So this was back in 2007. Okay. Yeah. So, so, you know, so I ended up on a high dose of Adderall. So I already had problems with stimulants and, you know, caffeine wasn't doing it for me anymore because I had sort of reached tolerance to that. I'd stimulated myself in every possible way. At that point, when you have a system as depleted as mine was, and with stress metabolism, stress mitochondria, stress adrenals, the whole thing, um, and you throw amphetamines into the mix to compensate for an energy deficit, um, that's sort of like putting jet fuel in a car engine that's already running and you know high and exhausted and overheated and fixing to die anyways. So obviously, it seemed like a miracle drug at first because it got me off the couch, it got me back into things, mm. and short-term instant gratification, like amphetamines would, you know, obviously, but at long-term cost, um, that's a whole nother level when you talk about amphetamines, right? You know, yeah. caffeine is one thing, but the way that amphetamines work, um, they can completely blow out a system, which is what happened. It was sort of like the straw that broke the camel's back for me. I ended up on the, the amphetamines uh, for... 
about a year and a half only it took. That's, well, probably that's a long to, time though. It is. It is, especially for someone who is as run down and you know yeah. in, in the situation as me. But I had no. I was never given any warning at all that something disastrous could have happened. I thought it was a miracle at first, and actually, the psychiatrist even used the term miracle drug. This is a miracle drug for so many people. Okay, great. So, so not only did it start to deplete me just exponentially more rapidly, uh, but it also completely hijacked my brain and my psyche and my personality. Um, unlike caffeine, that doesn't really work like that. Amphetamines if you already have a hyper impulsive personality or if you're teetering towards that imbalance of sympathetic dominance, it can lead you into a state of like amphetamine induced mania, which is basically what happened to me. Hmm. And within like two or three months, my personality and my life had totally transformed and started to completely resemble the life and environment of, uh, in the life environment of a meth addict, basically, right? And, you know, which is what I ended up in um, as where, okay, so I was, you know, working multiple jobs and I was, you know, uh, you know, high level athlete in NCAA and was doing all these things that were, you know, good, obviously highly productive, even though I was, I was unhealthy. Um, within months, I started doing things like going on buying sprees, right? Uh, oh, interesting. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars of credit eventually. Um, I did things that I would never have even imagined. Like I went and bought a bunch of exotic animals uh, and the apartment that I was living in, like it was, it was completely, it was like something that you'd see. Uh, like you know, tigers? Did you, yeah, what tiger? It wasn't quite tiger. Are you like the, are you like the Arkansas version of Tiger King? Right, exactly. No, <laughs> I always say, you know, uh, it, it was sort of like a weird, crazy cross between Ace Ventura and Breaking Bad. Like what the, if you just, you know, because it was like, it got really dark because I ended up in a situation where I was in the midst of like this drug world and now was connecting with people that were sort of on the same sort of perspective, energy vibe thing. And, you know, ended up around a bunch of drug addicts. I had drug addicts sleeping on my floor. I had a 700 square foot apartment full of animals. I had monkeys, dogs. I had a fish tank full of piranhas. I had iguanas everywhere. Oh my had, God. It was nuts. It was completely insane. Like. <laughs> And I never would have done that before. It, this was like a, a, a horror story of like an outcome. Yeah. Like okay, but wait, the exotic animal, what is it just because it's thrilling? I mean, nobody has a piranha in their fish tank. So it's like the high of knowing you have, you stick yeah. your hand in there, it may it, chop it off. It, it's just, if you've ever seen someone who's on meth, which is basically, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically indistinguishable from Adderall, just a different concentration, different delivery system. So a lot of times, it goes more intense because people are smoking meth. But for me, I was already way up here in my chemistry. I sort of reacted to that level where it was like a psychosis, where you just start just doing, just sort of, um, you know, capitalizing on all of your most impulsive, just, you know, you know delusional wants. I guess. Oh my gosh, that's so <laughs> funny. But no tigers, you didn't end up with any tigers? I, I actually came close to it. I, I was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, I, I was in contact with this breeder that lived in the mountains over there in Tennessee and, uh, and she was trying to sell me lion and tiger cubs and I was delusional enough where I almost bought them. It was nuts. Like, oh I, my I God. Them. So in I, your it, apartment? It, it, yeah. Were... It, what, it was nuts. <laughs> it was, it was crazy enough. Like I had, yeah. you, know, and the, you know, the monkeys I had, I had two capuchins and I had a rhesus monkey too. A rhesus monkey ends up being like as big as a baboon, but I, <laughs> I just, Oh my God. Where did the monkey sleep? Well, he didn't get that old because he actually tragically died. One of them did because my apartment started to get so toxic because it turns out I had toxic mold in there on top of everything, like black stecky botrys. And I was, animals were pooping everywhere. I couldn't, uh, you know, keep up with them in my delusional state. So I just started dumping and dousing chemicals like you've never seen, like opening cans of Lysol, dumping it on the car. I was, I was completely out of my mind. It was crazy, Cameron. That's crazy. A lot of people don't, don't believe this, by the way, because they know me now, right? They, they know yeah, me now. Right. Was, you're, you're so calm. Yeah. I'm, yeah, because that's, I've spent years sort of, you know, developing the very grounded, rational side of myself <laughs> and uh, the, you know, the structure and the systems and all that stuff that uh, was kind of there, but totally went out the window on, you know, under the use of drugs. And then I hyper developed it later on to try to balance and ground it out. How did, how did you get rid of the animals? Did you just like well, when? Yeah. So it became so toxic, which is what led to me 
you know, getting as profoundly sick as I was on top of the Adderall, on top of everything, on top of the massive amounts of chemicals and ammonia that was coming from all the animal poop that was oh locked there, not cleaned up for months. It was like a bad episode of Hoarders mixed in with Ace Ventura, right? Like, it was just like all that stuff combined, right? The worst <laughs> thing you could imagine. The worst thing you can imagine, it was worse than that. There's people I didn't even know, like sleeping on my floor. I haven't even met, like eating pizza off the floor. I wake up in the morning. It's nuts. But so, so, <laughs> so like, um, it, it's, it stopped basically because my, my life, obviously this is the most unsustainable set of circumstances you can imagine. So it's going to self digest. Yeah, something's got to give. Down, right. Yeah. And, and, and it did, it broke down. Not, I had, I ended up getting like thousands of dollars stolen from me from drug addicts mm -hmm. that were going around and stuff. I ended up, um, my animals started randomly getting sick and dying because of the air quality in there. So I then had to freak out and like rehome the ones that I had left. I oh. saved the monkeys. I saved, I saved uh, my dogs. I found good families for them. Thank goodness. You know, um, my parrots, I had to, yeah, I had to, I saved one of them. One of them didn't make, so, so it was, it was, um, yeah. So I, I had all that going on. Things broke down. I got the rest of the funds that I even had available to me basically wiped out from me. And I had basically charged and I, I had done all kinds of other things, bought all kinds of things, hundreds of thousands of dollars. You, you were talking, you know, you know, ridiculous um, without ever doing anything illegal. It was all like self-destructive behavior. Right. I just right. You know, developed all this debt and now I had all my money stolen from me. And then I started to get sick too. Like, mm -hmm the canaries in the coal mine, which were literally like yep. my parrot, I had a parrot that died first, literally a canary in the coal mine almost. Literally, um, yep. Where it's like, okay, something's wrong. And I was sleeping in this place. Um, so, I mean, I was already sick. I was already burned out, which is why I went on Adderall to begin with. And then after a two year amphetamine binge on an empty tank, plus this massive exposure to stachybotrys and mold and chemicals and the, the entire thing, um, to say the bottom fell out would be like the understatement of the century. So I ended up completely broke in debt, which was the least of my worries, and all of a sudden started to deteriorate rapidly. Um, and I knew, you know, first of all, that I had to, I had sort of a, um, uh, I, I had a psychological intervention at one point. I actually, in this unhealthy state, the thing that saved me perspective wise, that allowed me to sort of, you know, take a step to sort of, you know, out into a new trajectory was, um, I, in this unhealthy state, I came across psychedelic compounds in an unhealthy context. Um, and I had an experience on psychedelics, which a lot of people talk about today, which is a double-edged sword and it's a very complex topic and everything. But you know, the one thing that happens under those states is profound uh, states of introspection mm -hmm. can happen. And um, I had an experience where I was able to objectively look at all the circumstances in my life like uh, like an engineer would look at a schematic outside of my subjective emotional compromised drug hijacked state and under a five hour experience on on psilocybin which you know comes i was from, gonna say what was it It was psilocybin yeah you know the first yeah. was psilocybin and then i explored it further and did some other things in ayahuasca and everything like that um and that just that five hours transformed my life uh and the you know the subsequent um sessions that I had. I was always extremely intentional about it. I was so serious. Was it under medical supervision? Oh, no, no, oh, no, no, because <laughs> you still well, had rhesus monkeys and yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, but afterwards, you know, you know, later on, I did, you know, you know, some sessions, I was yeah. like that, but um, they, they're, um, they're, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, this was, it was totally, but I, I went into it. I was so broken down completely emotionally. I was seeking a very, very um, authentic experience. So I was never, I came across it kind of recreationally, but then it sort of showed me something different. And so I then stepped into it fully, like looking for answers internally. So I always was very, you know, intentional about taking it. But, you know, basically that, that intervention was sort of, it was the tipping point that gave me that completely new perspective and um, allowed me to sort of reset my entire psyche, both, you know, you know, physically, psychologically, emotionally, and I uh, got, you know, a whole new sort of, um, you know, interactive mainframe, uh, you know, through which I could proceed, right, you know, so. Um, what was your biggest aha? Did you, like, what was the thing that let you take action out of that life? 
the biggest aha you mean like psychologically or the, yeah uh, like when you were on when you were on the drug looking back yeah. at your life at, and then i've heard that it stays with you so when you come out of it you still have the perspective absolutely yes and yeah. there had to have been something that moved you into like oh i don't want this life i'm living i got to move into a different yeah. state of of life well, well it was everything it was sort of like um it, it was sort of like somebody took over under the influence of the drugs and it lifted that veil and allowed me to see things objectively like I was an objective observer, right? Got it. I can look at this whole mess that was in front of me and I'm like, okay, that's insane. As where, when I'm yeah, in the middle of- There's a monkey in your house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, I, I, I'm in the middle of the storm and I have become part of the madness, right? And that's mm. part of what addiction does to you, both, both physically and then all the psychological, emotional parameters that form around it. You form a cocoon of denial to protect um, your sort of blissful state that you're sort of escaping into, right? And so you compartmentalize these parts of your psyche, which is what all addicts do, which is why they live basically in alternate universes where what they're doing is totally rational and to sane, regular people is profoundly, you know, insane, right? Um, so... You know, under the influence of, of, of psilocybin, I was, it brought me out of that and I was able to see everything and I was able to see all the circumstances leading up to it. Like I was able to zoom out on my entire life and to sort of revisit the entire continuum of events that had occurred back from my childhood leading up into adolescence. And I didn't know how to art fully articulate and explain all the biological stuff yet. That would come later. But I knew intuitively that there were susceptibilities there and that this, this sort of continuum of events that led up to me escaping into this Adderall thing had corrupted and hijacked my psyche and my, my whole framework of emotions um, you know, to where I was, I was an alter ego caricature of myself at that point. I was no longer myself. And coming back and sort of peeling back those layers, which is what psychedelics do, they temporarily dissolve boundaries. And they don't do the work for you. And that's the mistake a lot of people make. They just have the vision and they continue on with their, with, you know, whatever they're doing. They show you um, your innate potential by dissolving the, the, the boundaries and the identities of, you know, the things that you've taken on. Right. And they, they can help you get to sort of that existential core of what all of us are. Um, you know, that sort of genuine, authentic, sort of unconditional love sort of core that's really at the, the center of all human that's beings. That's cool. Um, and, and you feel that and you know, whether or not it's just an experience and it's actually happening, it's that's, that's all a more complex discussion, but the experience was real is that I completely changed and got my sanity back after taking this stuff. Right. That's crazy. You know, and that, that also opened my mind up to the entire world of, of the natural ecology and the intelligence of nature and what it can offer. If I can take this mushroom and it can literally come in and be like a, psychiatrist or a psychotherapist that will deliver more in five hours than I've experienced uh, therapeutically in 21 years of my entire life, um, then obviously there's an intelligence there and it's communicating to me through chemistry. And it's an expression of this sort of, this, this sort of um, innate intelligence that resounds throughout our entire natural ecology, which extends into higher life forms like people. But anyways, I, it, it woke me, it, it sort of, it got me interested in, in just natural living, the natural ecology, natural yeah. medicine. It's like, if, if nature provides this, what else does it provide, right? And right. I would use that later on. And eventually that's, that's, that experience is partially um, responsible, not only for me surviving and getting on this trajectory, but also for me having the mental framework to be able to um, uh, you know, have the correct perspectives and connect the right dots to be able to find some of the things that I found and to get into this whole world of Kava here. Um, so how do you, do you go from like a drug state with exotic animals to insight to natural healing? Like how, do, how do you move in? I mean, I've, yeah. again, I've met you several times. I never knew that story. Yeah. I thought you were just the Kava guy. I yeah. didn't know that you had that whole, but, and it makes sense that, you know, we, you know, our fascinations, we can, you know, use it for good or we can use it for bad. And thank God you used it for good because we all get to benefit from Kava now. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, <laughs> our, you know, pressure makes diamonds, right? Uh, that's a, a saying that uh, is, is really applicable, you know, and anyone who's experienced trauma or adversity or just anyone who lives in the world in 2020. 
Um, the, yeah, right. <laughs> a lot of know, diamonds being made this year. <laughs> the, the most interesting people that I've ever met in my life are generally the people who have been through the most profound levels of adversity, right? Yeah. Because, it, I mean, it really does. It shapes you and it brings things out of you. Adversity brings things out of you that only necessity can bring out of you, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, there's, there's two main ways of growing. There's the desperation and there's, uh, you know, the inspiration, right? You mm -hmm. can put motivation in there as well too, which springs Love off that. of desperation, right? Mm -hmm. um, desperation is the most powerful because it's linked to our, our sort of evolutionary survival adaptation mechanism, which is the most powerful thing that will come out of us, whether we like it or not, right? Because everything is about survival and adaptation, right? That we right. talk about physical health and that's, we use the body's, survival response to make us stronger and to put pressure so that it actually catalyzes the strengthening and it brings out this amazing life out of us. But that definitely happens just in life circumstances. When your back is really up against the ropes and you're in the deepest, darkest place imaginable, you all distractions are taken away and the pressure is on and you have nowhere to go but inwards to examine mm -hmm. every aspect of what got you there. And if you value life enough, which most people have that inside them, if they're able to find that, then the most profound things will come out of you. The most, uh, you know, things that I believe is inside of, well, you know, a framework that's inside of every person tends to come out, you know, whenever the pressure is really, really on, right? Um, things, you know, experiences like psychedelic experiences force you to look at that. You can induce that without going through a profoundly traumatic experience. Um, but if you put the two together, then you get something that's exponential, which I think is what happened in my case and so yeah. many other people that I know as well, too. How'd, but, you uh, how'd you discover neurotoxicity and mold and get to Dr. Pompa? Because it seems yeah. like you, were, you already had some momentum before you even figured out that toxins were damaging your brain. Yeah, so basically when I went off Adderall, I, I had my experiences with, with psychedelics and it wasn't just, it was everything around that everything broke down and I went through this entire internal sort of transformation over a period of time. Um, but also my, my physical health, you know, once I said, okay, I've got to, I stopped Adderall cold turkey, which is not the best way to do it, but I just knew I couldn't be that person anymore. And so I just did that. Um, my system completely crashed, right? Mm. Uh, it was it was just artificially keeping my system elevated, even though it was rotting and, and just completely destroyed on the inside. So I thought I was tired before I went off Adderall and it crashed. Afterwards, you know, tenfold, 50-fold. I mean, brain fog and fatigue don't even begin to describe it. It was like brain dead and could not get off the couch to save my life, right? The kind of fatigue is almost in indescribable it's like the kind of fatigue that you would expect out of like a 90 year old person who's on their last leg like you have no energy right mm. you barely have enough energy just for your body to perform its functions for survival just to, to eat or digest food I, I you know i eventually almost lost that so i have a body that's completely fried at that point but i do have a fresh new perspective and i have like i've tapped into this almost endless reservoir of inspiration and motivation that again most that, that everyone has inside them but the pressure just pulled it out of me. So I had that. And all I needed was that because the most important resource absolutely is, is your own divine inspiration, is your own hope. It's, it's the most important nutrient that you can have because you can build anything off of that if you have perspective. Yeah, so yes. you know, once I had this perspective, my body was completely destroyed. But I knew, I, I basically had two options. Either I stay and I fight this thing and find an answer, which nobody in my world had for me at all. Psychiatrist basically just said, "Oh, sorry, sorry." You know, like it was like I have no, I don't, know. I don't know how to rebuild a body. I don't do that. Um, and so I just basically I had to start from scratch and just learn the standard philosophy and see what was outside of the allopathic model. And I basically just started using every bit of my energy that I had left, which I basically I had to. I was I was handicapped at this point. My brain, I, I was having so many cognitive deficits just from what the drugs did to my brain and everything. At the time, I was to a point where uh, I would have total lapses in my working memory and even my perception, depth perception, and actually was getting to a point where I wasn't even recognizing sometimes people in my family. Like I would have these blurbs, so it, it was wow. like crazy kind of cognitive deficit. So I had to basically move back in with my family and they didn't how old, know what to do. How old were you at this point? I was 21. Oh, so. wow. Yes, or 22, sorry. Um, and, you know, basically 
I was so lucky because I had a family that was just the most loving, supportive family that you can imagine, but they had no answers, right? Like they, they yeah. didn't know what to do, but I had a place to go. It wasn't one of those situations where they're like, they didn't understand it. So they just like left me on the street. Oh, figure it out. You know, it's like they knew as self-sufficient as I was, if I was in the state I was in, it was serious. Yeah. But um, still, you know, most of the people in my life couldn't see that on the outside, even though I was like headed towards um, you know, death eventually. They didn't see yeah. it till later on when I actually was near death. But wow. it started this whole process of basically being locked in my home. Couldn't leave the house because I would get confused. I couldn't drive anymore um, because for obvious reasons, that perception, you know, you know, everything. I couldn't drive, couldn't do anything, Had was in massive debt, which my family was able to help me out of temporarily, thank goodness. Um, otherwise, I would have ended up homeless and probably just would have wow. died. We, we would have been a you know, total disaster. Uh, but, you know, again, so I just, I was, but I was completely inspired to get myself out of this because I just felt intuitively that there was an answer out there somewhere and I didn't care how long it was going to take, you know, I was going to find an answer. So I basically just started digging into medical and scientific literature and, you know, just, just, you know, reaching out to doctors all over the country. We ended up traveling to different places. Obviously we first exhausted what was left of the allopathic model in Mayo and all this stuff. And then I ended up sort of in the alternative route and trying these little single shotgun approach therapies of one therapy here, therapy there, and just learning the process of what this whole thing even means. Um, because of my perspective too, uh, you know, I had a pretty good sort of intuitive sense at this point of, you know, this idea of working upstream of like all the stuff that I was doing, the consequences of not working upstream was what I was experiencing. Right. Mm. I was not filling my well body. Said. energy. I was not healing my body. I was not building it up. I was just that borrowing from tomorrow to paper today and just destroying, destroying, destroying. So I was not at all a fan of the drug route. I knew that that wasn't an answer. In fact, yeah. that killed me. So I was looking for anything and everything. So I just started with the basic, you know, the basic, uh, uh, you know, philosophical principles of naturopathic medicine and chiropractic. And I read anything and everything that I could get my hands on. I already was savvy towards like, you know, reading science and scientific literature because I always just had a, uh, you know, a little bit of a knack for it. I mean, I was interested, I was, I was a distance runner. So I did that stuff for performance. I was into the sciences and everything and, and knew a fair amount about biology on a basic level from nutritional supplement performance standpoint. So I had a relatively good framework to work from, um, but I used basically all the cognitive energy that I had left on a day-to-day -day basis to just scour every piece of information that I could find. And I did that for years. And for years I was deteriorating, deteriorating because once mm. you're down that low, you know, now, you know, your system has already begun to fail at multiple levels. The gut has begun to fail. You be, you become so toxic that now you can't get the bad stuff out of the cell. You can't detox and now you can't get the good stuff in. And so everything that you're doing, even dietarily or just living in this world, or even just your own waste, you become progressively more toxic, even though I was off the Adderall and out of the apartment and stuff. So I was sort of at a race against time. And so I had like the highest amount of pressure, like someone had a gun to my head at all times because I was not only profoundly, you know, suicidal passively in the sense of like, my brain was so depleted that I had the most severe depression and cognitive deficit and severe, developed severe anxiety and just, just, you know, just, I mean, everything that you can imagine from just being completely wrecked and having no brain chemistry, you know, really to go Left, off yeah. you know, thriving brain chemistry anyway, just from a metabolic standpoint. So I spent years doing that. One thing led to another, um, met a lot of people in the field. We traveled around, uh, you know, did everything from nutrient IVs to hyperbaric oxygen, a lot of things that are good in systems, but weren't the right things for me at the time. I needed to work at a basic level and then use those things as the icing. Yeah, get the foundation, yep. Exactly. So it took me sort of, you know, several years to build that framework. I ended up so, so sick though, that I ended up, um, profoundly chemically sensitive in one of these sort of neurotoxic, uh, you know, syndromes, right. That we sort of alluded to at the beginning that that's where I ended up. I became so toxic that I ended up developing profound environmental sensitivities, sensitivities to almost every form of environmental stimulus. That means food, supplements, chemicals, yeah, yeah, lights, just reacting. Sound, EMFs, the entire thing, which is what you see in really toxic people. Like the most yeah. toxic people you've ever met, 
whether it be someone who came home from you know the Gulf War and was exposed to a lot of chemicals and other traumas, uh, or whether it be you know just uh, you know a person who got a lot of chemical exposure, whether they're a painter or a landscaper or anything like that, you have the right storm going on. You become toxic enough your system eventually starts mobilizing a constant defense response against everything because it's been so traumatized. It's trying yeah. to help you out. So it, it like you basically anything that comes in, it starts freaking out. It can't take it anymore. It yeah. storm, it's saying, no, you have traumatized that it. it gets so confused. Right. And that's basically, it's a total distortion of the body's signaling systems to where it can't keep on an even keel from what's good and what's bad anymore, even. So it, it's not even, it's producing its own inflammation based on every form of stimulus. Yeah, so, so many people, are, so many people right now are like that, but maybe a little less, yeah. less, but. Spectrum, spectrum yeah. Right, but yeah. I think we have, I mean, if you just take autoimmune conditions, that's like so many people are in that state where they're just reacting, 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 yes. reacting. And a lot of times it's subclinically, right? The, you know, the epidemic of autoimmune disorders and disease is a huge percentage of people in the world and you know Americans especially are on the autoimmune spectrum but they're just not to that severe level like me right you know, everything is obvious but they're like it's like people like me are literally like the canaries in the coal mine for this environmental explosion great of point toxins emfs the soup that we live in today and what we're seeing in the future and where the statistics are going is that you know you know you know literally like you know 2035 it's supposed to be one in three i believe on the autism spectrum which yeah. is an autoimmune component at its base um you know you know cancer obviously alzheimer's issues, alzheimer's psychiatric yeah. conditions these are all conditions of immune dysregulations where it'd be extreme hyperimmunity, which eventually you end up in hypoimmunity and you end up in cancer type metabolic situations but it's it's a total dysregulation of the immune system because the immune system is an interface between us in our outside world. And when mm -hmm. our outside world becomes progressively more stressful, traumatic, and toxic, eventually it overwhelms and distorts and just destroys the immune system, which leads to friendly fire and this never ending inflammatory cycle. So yep. learning and you know, you know, today learning how to adopt adaptive behaviors to build up our resilience against stress, trauma, toxicity of all kinds is the answer. Cause you can't avoid everything, right? Right. But th that was something that I eventually had to learn. But during my process, you know, getting back to this, I, I deteriorated to the point where I end up in this, in this medical research facility that's down in Dallas, Texas. There's basically like a, like a, <laughs> like a hotspot for environmentally ill chemically sensitive people, like the most sick people that you've ever seen or met in your life from all over the world, they end up here. I didn't get any great help on the solutions there, but I did get a lot of education on pulling together the pathology mm. of all the different, you know, you know, sort of collective contributing factors chemically, right? You know, got a good education there on what mold had done to me. And this is where I started to pull together some of what I had read into sort of like a, a framework, you know, to work from. Yeah. And why you was, weren't healing, you're probably, cause exactly. you weren't in the, you weren't in the exotic animal apartment anymore. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Why, why was I still getting worse even after taking away a few of these things? Because there was so much accumulated interference, right? You have to remove, like our, our you know, mentor, Dr. Pomp always says, you always have to, you've got to remove your body from the source, but then you got to remove your source from the body, right? Oh, you got to so remove well the, you know, yep. the accumulated interference that's built up in the body. Yeah. And since I didn't have any means of doing that. I was sort of doing these one therapy things for a long time. At that place in Dallas, I got a good education as to, that was the first time I had the bucket metaphor really sort of mm. solidified to me. And I was, I had read all of these things, but it helped to kind of slowly pull it together. It was at that time when I was absolutely like at the precipice of my worst, even when I was there, they quarantined me and I was basically staying in this, um, in this quarantine facility. That's, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a fun word today, quarantine. Yeah, I was just going to say quarantine as a whole new, you were, uh, yeah, you were fat, you were quarantined before it was fashionable. Uh, yeah, we, we, yeah, I was on the cutting edge of quarantine. <laughs> uh, so, and, and at that time, it was like being an alien, right? Like, you know, yeah. people, imagine people in my family, like in Arkansas, or people that I knew, like, what is going on with this? Like, it's just one thing after another. All they saw were these things happening with me over years. And now I'm off being quarantined and they're like what is it all in your head like that's basically like what a, a lot of it ends up being as far as the perspective around you and people in your life which is another collective trauma but um but anyway so i was there at my worst and i i deteriorated to a point um where i was 
I was literally so reactive that I lost virtually all foods, all supplements, and was forced into fasting really for the first time, um, which was good, but not good in the sense that I couldn't stop fasting, right? It was, right. It was like I was I was forced into very, very long fast, but also I was just so weak and it, you know, eventually I got so reactive. I was, I, I, yeah, I was reacting to water. And that was really around the time that I met Dr. Pompa, that I met Dan, and uh, which was a godsend, which was sort of the catalyst that really sort of jettisoned me into this world. Um, you know, we started working together. I had met him through, you know, getting integrated sort of into the system and someone had thrown his name out there. I had come across him and his stuff and everything. And I had reached out to his wife, Marilee, and given him this long, this like, this is where I'm at. And she's like, holy crap. You know, I was like, let me get you on the phone. My yeah. And I, and uh, you know, he and I hit it off instantly. I mean, I told him my story and I was talking and he agreed to take me on as a client. And then we started working together and then that sort of spawned our whole relationship and everything that we've done since then. But basically whenever he and I first started working together, I was at my very worst and I had just come off of literally almost dying uh, because I had lost all foods, even water, and was forced into this sort of the, what has become in our circles, people sort of know me as the person who fasted, you know, for a very long time, including, you know, 12 days without food or water. I was going to say, what's the longest you fasted? Oh, you know, yeah, much longer than that with food. I mean, you know, gone yeah. in, in the weeks, uh, you know, to month. Yeah, I mean, it's long, it, like, especially whenever you're that weak too. When you're yeah. that weak and you're fasting for weeks or, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a whole different. Ball. Did you find it helping you though? Cause at some point the intelligence is just doing what it needs to do to repair. Yes. But whenever you're that weak, you are getting healing that's happening, but it's not like all or nothing. It's like, you're definitely getting some healing that's happening, but it's so tough because metabolically it's so hard for you to make any mm. energy whatsoever yeah. that it's, it's also a, tra a trauma to your body. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people who are metabolically shattered, moving them that abruptly into like water fasting or especially dry fasting can also be traumatic at the same time as, as some good things are happening. Yeah, it's a very, I could see very, that. It's, it's, it's a difficult process. It's always a balance that you have to know when to get, it's the right thing to do, but you right. know, the right time is important, but not to mention just, you know, psychologically traumatizing on top right. of the, you know, the dry fasting, especially, but I almost died from dehydration you know, you know, kidney failure, the whole thing, you know, multiple organ failure, the whole thing. So I was in an intensive care like situation and through a profound, almost divine intervention situation, I was able to find a strategy, some of the, you know, things that I had, you know, put together and actually uh, asked for in this, in this facility that I was in, they had an antigen program and I was able to get the right concentration of a of a, of a benzodiazepine drug to reduce the reaction just enough where I could tolerate that to shut down my seizures that I was having, which were my reactions that were keeping me from eating. I would go into like full seizures. And so Crazy. it wasn't even an option for me to just force food or water down because right. I, I got to a point where another seizure could have killed me. So I was basically at my very worst and was able to shut down the reaction long enough to start getting water in and came through that hiatus of no water and, and was able to barely come out of that. And, you know, Dan and I started working together at that point, we started slowly doing some, some small fast, some this, some that sort of, you know, you know, inching in some things in small amounts and just using a bunch of different strategies to just dial it in to a very, very sensitized framework that I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. right? um, but the problem was my reactions were keeping me from tolerating almost anything. Your, bo we your body just kept going after supplements, everything. Yeah. Wow. I was far from in the clear, even though I had come through that uh, from almost dying and everything, I was still in a state where I was very, very weak. And I was on heavy doses of benzodiazepines to just control the, the, the nervous system reactions, the, you know, the seizure activity. Bad idea. I'd been down that road with drugs and I hesitantly took them. It was like a last resort because I hated drugs at this point, right? right. Adderall and all this stuff. And I was like, but I did it just because it, I was so glad to have something that could do something temporarily. But I knew that I knew what was going to happen. And I knew that eventually I was going to reach full tolerance and it was going to ricochet in the opposite direction. And then I was going to be in a severely um, serious situation. And benzodiazepines are just horrific uh, drugs long term to begin with. The withdrawal itself can kill you even if you're healthy. Um, you know, that's an epidemic outside of opiates and everything too as well. Mm -hmm. Plus, they're just incredibly toxic to your mitochondria. They're just like they're essentially a mitochondrial poison that, you know, mm -hmm. to your brain. And the state I was already in my brain, I was like, I don't want any part of this. This is only right. a short-term thing. 
So basically it came to a point here. I had years of research behind me at, at this point where I had already just thrown myself into every aspect of health and wellness and strategies and, you know, you know, you know, dietary lifestyle treatments, therapies, modalities. So I had a lot to draw from. Right. And then I had someone who could also had a, a tremendous amount of experience who I could, you know, consult with and help me sort of package it and put it together, which was Dr. Pompa. Um, and he, then he had all of his own strategies that he brought to the table. So that was sort of a perfect situation because whenever we got to that point, it was like, okay, I got to get off this clonopin. I've got to find a way to reduce my reaction so I can start tolerating fast and diet variation and, and actually get into a TCD process, which is ultimately the heart of how I really what you need. Make. So you had to do like uh, prep work before you could even detox. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. because, well, I couldn't even tolerate any of the, of the, of the detox compounds. Right. Yeah. Fascinating. And I started detoxing. It was just it, my, my limbic system needed to be held down. From the, from the moment, from the moment you met Pompa to like actually feeling like you had your, your groove again, how many years was that? That was about a good two years, probably a good two years where I was so down in the dumps. And once I really found and came across, you know, Kava was a big piece to this, yeah. you know, I, you know, once I got some, some leverage that allowed me to actually start getting nutrients into my body in high amounts and allowed me to tolerate fasting and detox and all this stuff, I started to, I was young enough that I started responding, but it was still mm. very slow because when you've depleted your system to that level, you not have only damaged your entire system, but you've damaged the system that is supposed to heal that system, right? Mm, you know, you know, we so talk about well the respiratory system, the nervous system, the immune system, you know, you, you know, there really is an extra system that's the body's regenerative system. And it's the body's that starts in the kidneys where your kidneys produce erythropoietin and it builds your blood from the bone marrow and it releases native stem cells into your body, which are responsible for maintaining the health and wellness of every tissue in your body. So this whole sort of, you know, you know, stem cell regenerative sort of apparatus in your body or system is really a system almost in and of itself, right? Mm. Meaning that whenever you deplete your body that low and you wipe out that system too, now there's nothing, you know, there's not enough. It's, it, you know, it's sort of like I've got a, I've got a, you know, a building project, like I'm building a building and all of a sudden I run out of funds and workers. I've got no workers and I've got no funds to pay anybody. If I destroy the building, but still have the workers and I still have the cash, then I can regenerate Rebuild it, it. How bad it is, right? Yeah. Wipe out everything. And you create so much interference that you can't even get in there and do anything. Like there's so much junk piled up on the site. You can't even build anything because you can't, you know, it's like if, if you've got a, you know, a junkyard that you can't build a new house on top of an old, you've got to get yeah. rid of the old stuff, clear the landscape. And then you've got to hire workers and then you've got to have cash. You've got to have the resources. Yeah. Such an important point for people who are really ill because mm -hmm. we, you know, we, I always think we still try when we're really ill to go to the, give me the one thing, even Kava. Like, I think it's really beautiful how yeah. you're like talking about your journey. And it's such an important thing for people to realize. I always call it the magic mushroom, the magic. There's no magic mushroom out there to save you. <laughs> you got to fight. And when your systems are down that, that are the ones to heal you, you, it's a bit of a journey back. You need a very comprehensive it, plan. It, it's always a multi-therapeutic approach. Like, like yeah. we always find that, that word that we always use is so important to understand. It's sort of like, and, and, and I've heard this metaphor used a lot too. It's like, if I'm, you know, there's a synergistic aspect to healing because our body's a complex system and we are an extension of a more complex system, which is the natural ecology of the world, the planet. Um, but, you know, it's sort of like if you're baking bread, which we're not necessarily like recommending, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully yeah, nobody's fasting bread. while they're listening to this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, you know, so it's like if you're baking bread, you know, you could bake the water by itself. You could bake the yeast by itself. You could bake the flour by itself. Nothing happens, but you put them all together and you put them, in the, you know, in the oven and all of a sudden you have something, right? So well said. The energy that happens between these different strategies. And there is no magic pill or powder or lotion or potion. You know, there are profound individual therapies that can make an excellent contribution, right? For me, stem cells was one of those that mm. it is not a magic bullet. If I would have just thrown that on top of a toxic system and not detoxed anything and done any of the prep work, wouldn't have gotten the results. But it was one of those things that contributed tremendously once I created the, the foundation. Love that it. Launched me to the new level, icing on the cake, right? Yeah. Kava is another example of that. When I came across Kava, Kava was an amazing, non-toxic, non-addictive, plant-based crutch 
that gave me the leverage that I needed to integrate the multi-therapeutic approach that would actually got me some inertia, right? That got me some- Yeah, how did, uh, how, how'd you find Kava? I mean, obviously you were on a journey of just learning, learning, learning. I was where, just, it just had become this sponge like you wouldn't believe, just this- Yeah, because your life depends upon it. That yeah. make, totally makes sense. So, but when you discovered Kava, I mean, now Kava's in a lot of places. I, 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 ha, I wanna chat with you about Kava bars. My kids have taken me to, they think it's the funniest yeah. thing, but Kava was not around when you found it. No, it, 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 was, it was around in a form that uh, in the West is called Kava Kava, which is still what most Kava that's out there is today, which is actually doesn't fit the definition of real Kava. No more than a caffeine pill fits the definition of coffee, right? right. Or no yeah. more than uh, white cocaine uh, fits the definition of coca tea from Peru, a medicinal brew that they make. You know, it's, it's, so it's a different thing. But I came across Kava because I was in this state of desperation. I was on the benzos. Remember, and, you know, uh, right. Dr. and I were working together. And he was saying, you got to have something else besides the benzodiazepines. And I was like, absolutely, I know. So I started scouring and going back through everything, my whole process and it already, I, I, I'd, I'd already come across Kava in the past. So I already had that to revisit, but I had tried what everybody else tr had tried. The Kava Kava powdered capsules from Whole Foods or health food stores and I tried every brand that I knew at some point and uh, was, was no more you know, beneficial or profound than a cup of chamomile tea, which is nothing wrong with. But um, for me, with what I was dealing with, I was kind of like trying to take down an elephant with a BB gun, right? I was gonna say, you needed more than chamomile tea at yeah, that moment. It, it was like, the thing is still coming at you. It's the, it's, you can throw all the BBs you want yeah. at. It's like, so, and I was kind of like, so I went through this process again. It's like, okay, I have to find a plant-based or fungal-based alternative to this synthetic pharmaceutical compound. Something that has a more complex array of chemistry that is biologically compatible, which most plant compounds are at least more so because they're a living system, like we're a living system. So they're not these little rip off individual molecules. Mm. That the body freaks out and says, whoa, we got too much of this. We're gonna shut down what, what we're producing, right? Already, you know? Um, so like for benzodiazepines, they work on this pathway in the body called GABA. That's the, the main mechanism. They bind to GABA A receptors. GABA is the main brakes of the nervous system. It's the main pathway of interest for anyone who's trying to relax and sleep and who has just sporadic activity at all in their body. It opposes glutamate, which is the most excitatory neurotransmitter, which is very important, but it's highly regulated. If it gets out of control, it starts to self damage the system um, through a process called excitotoxicity, which happens in autoimmunity and leads to seizures in many people. Um, so, you know, basically that's what the benzos was doing temporarily, but it was also depleting that system at the same time. Ah, yep. So I knew that I had to find something in the plant world. I was looking specifically in the literature and in the anthropological accounts for a GABAergic compound that had more complex set of chemistry that wouldn't have those issues that would still prop up that same system that I could have an off ramp off of those benzos. Okay, wasn't expecting to find it, right? Because like I'd been with chamomile and I'm like, okay, but I'm gonna explore it anyways because I explore everything. Um, obviously I went down the medical cannabis route first. You know, it didn't work. You know, cannabis doesn't affect that system. It, it does a little bit indirectly, but it affects the endocannabinoid system. So it's not a direct punch to that sort of, it, it mm -hmm. does, it can have anti-seizure activity, but in my case, it didn't work. And for many people, it doesn't. And, CBD wasn't near strong enough uh, and really didn't do anything. It, and um, marijuana was just too psychoactive and too, I mm. felt terrible. It, it made my anxiety worse. THC is like that. It, and it's just hard to tolerate. So is kava stronger than CBD or it just depends on your brain chemistry? Depends on your brain chemistry, but generally when you get good kava and we work with a lot of products that are on a spectrum of, of intensity, right? We do that specifically for different applications, right? Right. Kava that's strongest, no question is stronger than CBD. Uh, you know, CBD is one of those things that kind of runs in the background that you sort of take on principle uh, and it's more of a modulatory thing, which it can be great. I love CBD and we stack it with Kava sometimes. Um, but Kava, when you have it really strong, it, the effects can be strong enough. It's almost indistinguishable from alcohol with the, as far as the mood lift and stuff, but without the drunkenness. So it's mm. not like an inebriated state where you're a different person and you become aggressive it's like an enhanced state of sobriety where you have this huge mood boost and even like this, this euphoria to some degree with really strong, like if you're at a kava bar. Um, and it's like this, this calm enhanced focus that's also pseudo entheogenic, not entheogenic like magic mushrooms, meaning it doesn't take you to an altered state. You're still like in a sober state, 
but it still brings about that introspect and that, and that self-reflection that makes conversation so interesting and it makes it so easy to connect and empathize with people. Interesting. It feelings of empathy. So it's very, very good for cultures psychologically on a much deeper level than just reducing anxiety on the surface. The South Pacific um, and, you know, indigenous people have always known this, which is why kava is really their most sacred substance because if there's a dispute anywhere in, or, or everywhere in, in a village, right, say like in Vanuatu or Fiji where this stuff is from, the chief will set down the two people and force them to settle it over kava because that's, it's, it's I, that much of an empathogen, right? So, I think our country might need a kava, a kava break right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a very, it's, it's a, it's a very great tool for sure. But so I, I, was I, looking, heard, yeah. I heard you say something just uh, before you move on. I heard you say something somewhere about, you know, the thing about alcohol is that it does, it does change personalities. Mm -hmm. So, and it's so highly addictive. And I heard you say somewhere that kava doesn't make you someone you're not. And I, I could, I have a ton of friends who we love to go out and have a glass of wine together. And some, you know, some of them turn into people you don't really want to have a glass of wine with anymore. <laughs> and yet kava makes you more of who you were meant to be and who you are truly. Why is that? Yeah, yes, yeah, so they have a saying in the islands, uh, you know, a man who drinks alcohol becomes a beast, but a man who drinks kava becomes more of who he really is. That's, that's the saying, right? And so that's the, why they have kava bars and they have 20 times more kava bars than they do regular bars in Fiji and Vanuatu because they prefer it over alcohol because you get most, if not all of the benefits plus more without any of the addiction, the withdrawal symptoms, the, the, the aggressiveness, the changing. And so basically what, you know, just like synthetic drugs like benzodiazepines, which alcohol works on those GABA receptors too, as well as uh -huh. dopamine and other things, you know, alcohol. So if, Compounds like psilocybin mushrooms and cannabis and kava to a much more balanced degree that's more tolerable maintaining sobriety, it's, it's in its own category. They're all entheogenic substances, meaning that they tend to introduce introspective thoughts and allow multiple, both hemispheres of the brain to connect more easily through these chemical pathways, whether it be the tryptamine receptors, the GABA system, the dopamine system, but they allow more interconnectedness to happen within the brain. So they allow for more systems thinking, right? And they also Sounds allow perfect. for a reflective sort of state of mind, which from a philosophical standpoint, you could say this is nature trying to communicate messages to us through chemistry because they can't speak like higher vertebrates do. And that's a, a philosophical thing, but we know that that happens, right? Um, which is why it's good for processing trauma because you, you can't change the past, but you can change how you relate to the past. And you can change subconsciously and begin to shift some of those unconscious trauma patterns if you can change the narrative subconsciously, which is hard to get to because consciously right. you only have access to. So if all those substances are entheogenic, I refer to alcohol and synthetic drugs as, as antheogenic, right? Meaning that they, they tend to have an effect that's opposite. The more alcohol you consume, you can actually consume a small amount of alcohol and it be okay and loosen you up just enough and everything. Okay. So especially if you're drinking some good biodynamic wines. Yeah. Like, a little um, dry farm wine. We yeah, need we Todd got, in on I, this I, conversation. I, I, I don't want to dog on dry because I, I love, <laughs> love him. But, um, but the more alcohol that you consume, it tends to bring you into a more primitive state of mind where your actions, your thoughts, your, you know, everything gets more primitive where all you want to do is sort of your primitive things. You want to laugh at really stupid stuff you know, you know, all, all the stuff that goes with alcohol consumption, right? Mm -hmm. And you tend to get angry or you tend to get jealous of this or you tend to get this or that or whatever. It, it, you know, these are obviously general statements, but if you consume over a certain amount, almost everyone gets to a place in which is not good for their psyche, right? Yeah. And it brings out some sort of negative. You know. I haven't heard anybody say that drinking more makes them a better person. Well, exactly. Because you don't get into a more introspective state and clear state by drinking more alcohol, you get into a less, you get more confused, you make less sense, right? Mm -hmm. So you get more primitive in your thinking, more surface level, more simplistic, and you just become kind of a, a, a surface level person who's just feeling good at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of, that's why we call it an antheogen, right? Mm -hmm. It can be okay in certain amounts, but, but kava gives you the same feeling of relaxation and connectedness, but it's the exact opposite in the sense that it makes you, you feel more sober and if you're having conversations over kava, they are almost always interesting <laughs> because interesting, it brings huh? you into this introspective state where you almost always end up, if, especially if you're you know, with a conscious, you know, you know, person who's also there sort of, you know, that you're, you, you're already have a lot in common with, you tend to go very deep and genuine and authentic in conversation whenever you're 
under the influence of kava. Not as much with like the more subtle forms of kava that are more just for just the, the anxiety relief, like you know, some of the stuff that we use, but like the, the, the kava that you get at a kava bar, you get a lot of that effect, especially if you use it and the effects accumulate over time and it gets more powerful the more you use it, um, which is the opposite too of a pharmaceutical. It has a phenomenon called reverse tolerance. The more you consume, it actually has an upregulatory effect. We know now from the literature on the GABA receptors instead of a downregulatory effect. Yeah, I, I wondered about that, like, with alcohol, even dry farm wines, because I've kind of played around with dry farm wines, like, is it helpful? Is it not? And again, I love what, what Todd White's doing. But I, as a menopausal woman, like GABA is massively important to me. So like what you're saying is just fascinating. And I'm thinking of all my resetters that are going through the menopause experience. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this could be an incredible answer. So what is there, does it help you naturally make more GABA when you're not on it? And does alcohol deplete your GABA stores? Absolutely. Is, there a, is there a difference there? Yes, there's a, it's, it's an almost an equal opposite difference. Acutely, it can feel similar because you're still enhancing and propping yeah. up the system, but alcohol and benzodiazepines both, uh, you know, affect the system in a more direct way with a linear mechanism where it forces sort of an agonist approach where it just sort of dumps your accumulated stores of, of GABA, but also stimulates the receptors in an agonistic way. So it, it stimulates this, this massive expression um, of the ion flow off of these GABA A and GABA B receptors, primarily the GABA A receptors, benzodiazepines. By doing that, the body responds and says, whoa, this is an outside thing. It's an outside molecule. There's no intelligence there. It's not a living thing that's, that's working on multiple different systems and all the different st steps of the biochemical sequence that surround the, the production of GABA and the entire parasympathetic process. So the body responds and say, we got too much of this. And it doesn't have this complex array of active living compounds that help to signal every step in the assembly line so that everyone stays on the same page and they keep the line moving and actually enhances their, their, right. their productivity. It's like an assembly line, right? Like, you know, every yeah, step. Yeah, it's a good analogy. Sequence, right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, with alcohol and benzos, they go in and they do that charge on credit, borrow from tomorrow to pay mm. for today, release it now but now you've spent it. Now you're going to be twice as bankrupt tomorrow. So you're going to be more anxious tomorrow. You're going to feel like crap. The yep. more you use it, the more you have to have more just to hit the status quo, because now you started to deplete what you have. So you need more of that stimulation to get the same effect. That's, that's dependency, that's tolerance. And then when you take it away, you have nothing left. So now you're not producing hardly anything. And now you're in withdrawal. And when you're- Does that, happen, does that you know, happen with CBD too? No, well, see CBD is a plant compound. Um, so with most plant compounds, they have a multitude of different active constituents where because they're a living organism, they have that intelligence there. Okay. Um, where it, it interfaces with your system in a modulatory way. So CBD, just like kava, has a modulatory effect. Now, THC in high amounts, especially in the amounts that we have today with these highly hybridized strains that are unnatural and even people get so much THC that it's, it can be pretty depletatory. It, it's still a plant. And if it's denatured, it can start to, it's not a tonic herb. It can start to deplete you if you overuse it, right? right. So not all plants have that perfect balance of just giving to your system. Some plants are more tonic, meaning the more you use them, the more they give to your system, rehabilitate, right. upregulate. Kala falls in that category, which is very unique, especially because it has such an amazing acute application as well. Cannabis, um, meaning marijuana, not CBD, is more of an acutely medicinal substance. It can be depletatory because it's so strong. Um, but not anywhere near what any pharmaceutical drug would be, right? Mm, so no one's dying from, from, from marijuana withdrawal, but it can be, it can you know, give you some short-term memory issues, kind of deplete your brain a little bit. Um, so it can knock you off your center if you overuse it. Yeah. Psychedelics yeah. like psilocybin mushrooms can also deplete your serotonin and exhaust your serotonin because they're, they have one molecule that's more of a linear thing, but nowhere near what say like an SSRI would where people are completely suicidal whenever they get off these things, right? So the plants are always more biologically compatible, but mm. plants like adaptogenic herbs and like kava have that perfect balance of acute, uh, of, of acute, you know, you know, therapeutic action to where they work immediately, like enough to like almost totally replace some of these things. But then they also give to the system and they're tonic, right? And they continue, mm -hmm. you know, they help rehabilitate. Yeah. They're not only just a crutch, they're 
you know, they're an amazing sort of acutely medicinal crutch, but they also work underneath the hood, right? It's like they prop it up with the jack, but they're also working underneath to help rehabilitate the parasympathetic nervous system at the same time. So, you know, the more you take kava, generally the less you even need over time. And then when you take it away, better than you were before. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It almost sounds too good to be true. Is there yes. any side effect at all? You know, uh, you know, like with anything. Okay. So with, with kava, there's huge quality control issues, right? So we can get a little bit into that. Yeah, here. talk but about that. that. That's a huge, there's, if, if you get the wrong material, you can actually end up with something that's kind of toxic as where, you know, regular traditional kava is not at all. Um, and you can also end up with something that can give you a lot of side effects and grogginess and, and mm-hmm. things and, and, you know, some things. So there are definitely drawbacks if you, if you source poor quality material. If you source pristine material, like we've worked so, so hard together, a huge supply, we control every step of the process, the growth, the harvesting, you know, you know, the stabilizing, the, you know, the end products. Um, it has probably the greatest therapeutic effect to drawback ratio of any single compound that I've ever worked with, right? Wow. Um, there are some compounds that hit harder, but then they have huge drawbacks. There are some compounds that you know, uh, you know, you can take just all day, every day, but then they don't give you that much acute therapeutic efficacy. Like they're more just, yep. you take on principle, even some adaptogenic herbs. It's like, you, you know, you take them, you don't feel much. Your know, kava is one of those things that can give you an amazing, um, you know, short-term benefit, but also have those things. So quality control is extremely important. Whenever I came across kava initially, um, you know, again, so like you know, back whenever I was like, okay, so I was, you know, I decided I was going to revisit Kava after I'd gone through the cannabis thing. I was like, I'm going to give this another shot because I, I, I had made some contact with individuals in the South Pacific, some farmers and some people in the industry. And I had said, you know, they say, well, you should absolutely try Kava, of course. And I said, I've tried Kava and, you know, these capsules. Mm. And they're like, that's not Kava. Stop it. Stop playing. That's not Kava. <laughs> you know, that, that, that was basically like their attitude towards it. They were kind of like laughing, you know, joking about it. Like, oh, come on, you know. Uh, so, so I was like, okay, so you know, and they were telling me about the traditional prep and being so different. And I, I had said, well, that makes sense because what I had tried from the grocery store was not in all in alignment with what I had read in the anthropological accounts and all the texts of this sacred substance that came out of, you know, came out of the natural ecology and just embraces you like a warm hug and gives you all these, these psychological and even spiritual benefits and all this stuff. And I'm like, I didn't get any of that. I took the whole foods from- brand didn't do that for yeah, you. Huh? Yeah, exactly. I, I was like, what, is, you, what are they talking about? These are just people just being overly poetic, right? Or something right. like, you know, but turns out that no, like, you know, this would not survive this long at this level in these cultures for 3000 years, as as long as it's been used in Vanuatu, this sacred, if there wasn't something significantly to it. In fact, in Vanuatu, they have psilocybin mushrooms, but kava is their most sacred substance. So, you know, interesting. Yeah. So, so anyway, so, you know, I asked them, okay, so what's the form that's that's the most therapeutic and powerful? And they said, well, the, you know, the uh, traditional prep. And it's like, well, okay, that makes sense. Cause I've read that actually too, before it come back to me. So I had them start to send me some of just pure kava root of these specific strains. Cause just like with cannabis, there's hundreds of strains of kava. Some mm. are strains that are categorized by effects. Like some are more daytime strains that are more nootropic and mood lifting. Some are more mm-hmm. nighttime, more heavy and sedating. But then also some are only meant for just acute use, right? They're, they're pretty aggressive on the system. They're closer to the wild form of kava um, and, and not the dialed in more domesticated form. So they have, plant defense compounds in it that are kind of rough on your gut and kind of rough on the system. Right. And so we all know this with, with the conversation around lectins and and oxalates and different things. These, this class of cultivars that are drank daily in the islands have virtually none of those because they've bred them out of them. Right. So there are these compounds called flavocholines and these are chalcones that are in all of the plant and they're part of the plant's defense system. And they're not a, a toxic level. They're just enough to where they stress out the system. Now, they can actually be acutely medicinal. And there's a huge volume of literature that's accumulating on these flavocholines and their usage against different types of cancers because they tend to disrupt um, the, uh, you know, the metabolism of, of, of unhealthy cells and healthy cells do adapt. So there's a hormetic response that healthy cells actually have an NRF2 upregulation. There can be a, a profound you know, medicinal component to slightly irritating the system with these compounds. But if you overconsume them, then they can give you a lot of side effects and make you feel like crap the next day and stuff. 
So we have some forms that we work with that have certain amounts of these flavocalanes for acute medicinal use, but then the daily ones we like to have, you know, little to none so that you can get the anxiety relieving effects and have them. Mm. So it's effects. like um, it's CBD. You've got your sativa and your indica, and right. one one lifts you, one puts you in the couch. So kava has the same thing. Yes, exactly, exactly. And even within sativa and indica, there's like hundreds of different right. actual strains. Those are just two species, right? And they tend to be the you know they're two species, and they have like hundreds of different variants of those. You know, just like people, right? All of us, we're all humans, we're all homo sapiens, right? But I grew up in a different house, different environment than you, and I adapted and, and, and expressed very, very differently. I'm a different mm -hmm. person, right, than you are. And, you know, same with all people, right? Um, dogs too, right? All dogs came from the wild progenitor, you know, you know, Canis lupus, which is, uh, you know, the gray wolf. But eventually, you know, epigenetics, environments change. We end up with a dog that's the same species that's a massive variant, like a chihuahua. Same right. species as a wolf. One can survive. One's very robust. One, you put it outside and probably die in two hours, you know. How and many strains, how many strains of kava are there? There's over 200 strains that are used regularly and more than okay. that, obviously. Now, uh, of these more domesticated strains and some that are closer to the wild progenitor. So, you know, kava, the, the uh, scientific name is Piper methysticum. The word means okay. intoxicating pepper. Um, and it's a... Um, it's a domesticated version of its wild progenitor, Piper wishmanii. Wild, wild kava is almost not consumable by humans because it's so aggressive that, you know, the indigenous people found out thousands of years ago, they consumed it, they got these great effects, but they felt like hell the next day because it had so many of these plant defense compounds in it that yeah. it just was so aggressive on the system. So they started to grow and plant in the ones that express lower amounts and over a period of time, they had bred strains where they had sort of bred down the aggressiveness and made it consumable. Same thing, a lot of people don't know this, like wild celery will actually burn you if you touch it because it's got a defense system in it. You can't eat uh, wild celery. Interesting. You domesticate it to a certain point to where you can eat it. Um, wild lettuce is actually has a psychoactive component to it. Like wild lettuce is actually a mild opiate, right? We breed it down to where it's more benign. You get, you know, you know some of the basic components out of it. So it's, yeah. it's hitting the sweet spot. Sometimes you want a little bit more of a wild thing that's got more of the adaptive hormetic medicine in it for short period of time, but they've dialed in a class of strains they call noble cultivars, and it's you have to have to meet, have to meet a certain chemical composition. Um, and this term was you know came out of Vanuatu where they've been using this. It's a huge part of their culture there, and the scientists down there have dialed this in. And most of the literature on kava is, is is centered around this classification system. Noble kavas are the ones that meet a certain chemical composition standard that have virtually little to none of these flavocavanes in them and high amounts of cavane and, and some of the other cavalactones. There's six major cavalactones, uh, uh, you know, two of which are double bonded lactones and the ratios are gonna you know, depict what the effects are, right? And the half-life, okay. how long they last and different things, right? So we get a chemotype off of every batch that comes in so we can, you know, we can tell what the effects are gonna be you know, based on the chemotype, but we're one of the only people that are working with our own farms where we grow individual strains instead of just a bunch of strains from massive fields that are all put together so we don't know exactly oh, what interesting. that's going to be. So we know specific strains for, spe you know, specific purposes that are noble cultivars and some that are outside of that for acutely medicinal purposes that are hit harder but are not as tonic in their use. But the baseline of what we use for our products is just the noble, very smooth, and package it in subtle forms where anyone can take it, even children, to where you get the effects. And then the products that we have, like our shots and stuff, and the, the, the drink line we have in the future are like the more powerful, like more recreational aspect of kava. Does it matter, like, do people smoke it? Do, I know yours are drops, right? Do you just put it under your tongue? Is there so a the difference? the that we have was the complex oil, right? So that okay. was the one that we actually developed the, the pressing process, which didn't elicit any oxidation to the material. We press it with seeds so that we don't damage any of the, you know, any of the, you know, the, the very fragile fats in there. It's not ground like in a, a, a you know, typical expeller press that pulls oxygen down into it and oxidizes it and everything. So we had to develop a process for getting the, the active constituent complex Crazy. out. There. The active compounds in kava are called kava lactones. Lactones are oily like lipids. They're like, you know, lipid compounds that float to the surface when you're making traditional kava. Traditional kava is made, which is what I had to do with the indigenous people who sent me the kava and I had to do this for years, like, you know, was make, you know, you get this dried root 
And that was what I had sent to me. And you put it in a strainer bag and you knead it out and squeeze it out into a bowl. I've seen you guys make it. I think I've seen you yeah. do the tea like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did that at at uh, at, uh, at Vegas. We did that. Yeah, at, there was one of the seminars I saw you at and you were you did it like, it looked like a big mess, but I remember like my tongue went numb and yeah. I felt pretty and that good. Was, like, fun just to kind of like show people what the, what the roots of right. it. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so we did that. That's what I had to do for years. Um, but you know, so basically you take the kava, you put it in a strainer bag, you knead it out for like 30 to 45 minutes. It's, it's a heck of a process and you end up with what looks and tastes a lot like a bowl of muddy water. Right. I mean, yeah, it so, looks like muddy water. Yes, exactly. So, so the, you know, the two main deterrents of real kava, even though real kava prepared like that is where you get the effects. If you extract it with solvents like alcohol or, you know, God forbid acetone and some of these things that, that some people are using, you cut down like 90% of the effects. You end up with that chamomile tea thing, like most of the kava out there. They just use, they try to apply these cookie cutter strategies without looking at what the indigenous people have done and, and the science on it and what the composition. So they, you totally miss over that whole thing and just end up with something that's not really kava. And, and so most of these products in the market are solvent extracted. Now, real kava, if you prepare it like I just described, it gives you the effects, but the two main deterrents are, it tastes like muddy water and it takes like 30, 45 minutes to prepare and it gets everything disgusting and your strainer gets all, you can use a strainer, it gets everything like your kitchen. It's like, you, to expect every person in America or <laughs> people on a large scale to do this on a regular basis is just such a pipe you get, dream. You get anxious just making it, huh? Oh yeah, and the indigenous people, you develop a taste for it but you have to give it enough time to where you, right. most people won't. It's just not practical, which is one reason why it's taken so long to get to the place that it's at. And the quality control issue has hurt its right. reputation. But if you get it right, it's this amazing, profound substance. So you have to take all these things into account. But you know, whenever you prepare kava traditionally and you get it right, um, it's absolutely amazing stuff. Whenever I first started using it, um, and it's, you know, so long story short, whenever I started to get the stuff and prepare it traditionally, I was on my benzos and everything, highly addicted to them, was in this horrible, horrific situation. Started preparing it traditionally, just like I was instructed, started drinking it in large amounts regularly, twice a day, doing this whole thing twice a day. I was able to, I felt an effect immediately, like this massive 10,000 pound weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Hmm. My reactions, all my reactions to EMFs, to supplements, to foods, all the things that I was hyper reactive to and just my inability to sleep, my limbic system, uh, it went down dramatically and all of my reactions went down by about 80 to 85% within the first like six weeks of doing this, which wow. I had been experiencing for like eight years. Right. And I was like, it, it, this was like beyond a miracle for me. Right. So right. I fell in love with it immediately and there's a cumulative effect because there's an upregulatory effect. Right. So the first time okay. you take Alva is going to be the least effective that it ever is which is the opposite of a pharmaceutical. Your pharmaceutical yes. first time hits the hardest, tolerance ensues, yeah. your body depletes because it's, it's depleting, right? It's yeah. downregulating. Kava, it starts to build up in your system, upregulate, and you get more of an effect the longer you use it. Um, wow. So after a person who's been using it for a long time feels it way more than someone who's just tried it. Um, but it's strong enough in its strongest forms that, that uh, the majority of people feel something the first time. But, Do so, you use it daily? Is it like, like something you would throw in your purse and like take on the, take with you every day? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. And, and, and I like to cycle everything, no matter how good or it is yeah. eventually because of some of the ways that it works. But, um, but if you're, no, if you're in a situation like I was, I used it indefinitely because that's the top priority. Multiple times, probably a yeah, day. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I, I got to a point where within two months of preparing it traditionally and using it, I was off my benzodiazepines in two months, which Amazing. is like unheard of. Those are some of the hardest drugs to get off of. Normally with a benzo, if you're that addictive and that fragile, um, it'll take uh, years to get off of it. You know, wow. a lot of times you have to taper very slowly over a year and a half. And sometimes it's impossible to get off of it. It's just so difficult um, to be able to get off of it and be symptom free basically within two months. It's, it, it, just, it, it was nothing short of miraculous. So I was totally 100% sold. All the anthropological accounts and the legend and everything was behind it. When I, when I was, I went back to a lot of my contacts in Vanuatu, I was like, this is legitimate. Like, yeah, I understand why you guys love this stuff. Um, so I fell in love with it, obviously. And, and Dan, uh, Dr. Pompa, obviously was there observing this whole thing too. Right. Although I was, you know, the one doing it and stuff, but he, he was, we started trying it on other very sensitive 
uh, patients. He had, me, he had me talk to him. And that was sort of my, my first level. In I remember it. you coming to the seminars and talking about it's, you know, having this product, it's coming, it's coming, and then the kava bar. And then the last time I saw you, you had it in tinctures and uh, you had it really systematized nicely for those of us that want the quick fix. Yeah. So it, it, talk a little bit about what the products you have now, because, and, yeah. and I'm also wondering if this can be really helpful for people when they're fasting, because do they have any research on it? Like blood sugar levels, does it affect blood sugar? That it, it, it seems yeah. like there's this moment when people are trying to repair their mitochondria. They're trying to go into these, into a better state that they could use something like this. Yes. So yes. And yes. So I, uh, so, you know, one of the biggest hurdles that we had whenever we started giving it to other patients is not everyone is as, as um, passionate as, as me and will just be willing to do, to prepare this stuff every single day. Now, you know, most people that are severely sick will, but the people that are kind of like moderately sick, you have a hard time even convincing them to do it Yeah. so much and it tastes nasty and the whole thing, right? So, so we, you know, that sort of, and this was years ago, you know, even when I started coming to the conferences and doing this, that was like, are into the development. I'd been developing the process, the, the supply chain, you know, you know, patenting the, you know, the, you know, the, the extraction stabilizing process. I had developed this whole infrastructure behind it for years. Crazy. How well, long did that take? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, several years, at least four or five years, probably of just, just constant development of like, you know, you know, meeting everybody in the world, all the top scientists in the world who had worked with Kava, all, all, all the regulatory agencies, figuring out where we were with everything. Mm. Whenever we did this, we wanted to be a full advocacy campaign where we're educating about this and we want to be, you know, setting the quality standards so that a lot of these misconceptions that have hovered around Kava can be fully dispelled, which they, they are pretty much because the science is over, you know, but there's, there's education. Just like right. CBD being re you know, introduced into the marketplace, we are having to do the same thing with Kava. And I believe that it has every ability to eventually become as common as a cup of coffee because, uh, you know, in this form. Mm -hmm. uh, so could you put it in your coffee? Absolutely. So that's that's one of the things that's why we, uh, you know, designed the Kavaflex oil like that. So there had never been a like a Kava oil supplement on the market because we had to, to, we had to develop this process of getting the Kava lactones out of it without damaging them at all. So I had to develop this, this, you know, with, you know, yeah. I had some people and we, we had to develop this, um, this special hydraulic pressing method that presses it no higher than 90 degrees. It's hydraulic, so it doesn't expel or doesn't oxidize or pulse, you know, uh, you know oxygen down into the, the plant material. And then we tested it before and after. Everything's tested to make sure that the chemotype is exactly the same, hasn't been denatured. We do lipid peroxidation testing to, to you know, to validate that there's no oxidation to the oil um, structure or anything. So that was a long time. So we developed the Kavaflex oil and I specifically developed it to not be the, the most, you know, sort of, you know, hit you over the head strength, like, you know, you know, some of the brews can actually be, I wanted it to be, you know, to give you all the general effects of Kava, but able to be taken at any time of the day under any context, even for children or even mm -hmm. pets and things like that. Um, so it's sort of the base product and it's great that it's in this oil form because it's a great additive to like foods and it's a great additive to coffee. There's a tremendous interesting, you know, between kava and coffee because kava is a ketogenic substance. You kind of alluded to that a little bit. And that's something that was never, you know, publicized ever before we got into this. And I'd found all this information in the literature and discussing the scientists. It wasn't known outside of the scientific community at all. Anyone who'd been involved in all this work. Basically, kava is a substantial activator of the AMPK pathway in the body. Yeah. It shifts the body into this like self-recycling mode, right? This ketogenic state where it activates this fat burning and cellular autophagy state. I thought I saw you say, or heard you say that it stimulates autophagy. Yes, uh, you're pretty substantially, more powerfully than any compound that I've ever come across. Wow. It's like a natural supplement. And I, and, and I would say that what we know in the scientific literature, but also my own experience with it, because that was a, a, a very uh, appealing side effect that I got once I started using it regularly was mm -hmm. like, remember, I was metabolically broken. I couldn't, I, I, you know, when, when, when Dr. Pompa and I were trying to give me a keto adapt, oh my gosh, that was tough. You know, trying to, I couldn't yeah, even. And I see that with a lot of people, like they're doing all the right things, but it's, you know, they just struggle to get but into that place of even metabolic make it health. Off of straight sugar, rocket fuel, like wow. it, you know, I, you know, much less like my own fat. It was difficult. 
So, but I noticed though, that when I was forcing myself into these intermittent fasting or fasted states, when I was on the kava or I took a bunch the night before, not only did it have this long, like the next day, I wouldn't get hungry like at all. And my brain was still on and I had like this sort of focus and I was there present and I had this mental clarity and I had this energy as well too. And I'm like, it, it was like night and day difference. It wasn't just like a subtle difference. It was like, and I noticed that like, if I was using kava regularly, like keto adaptation was like pretty easy, like for me. Wow. So I was, I was really fascinated by that. And I knew there was a mechanism there. So then whenever I found it in the literature and spoke with some of the researchers on it, um, made it actually was, you know, it was, it was kind of obvious to me already, but, um, so it affects that pathway. And, you know, the reason is, is that it, you know, it's important sometimes to take a step back and look at all of these compounds in their sort of like philosophical sense, right. And like sort of their context and their role in the natural ecology. Kava is a protective substance. Kava plays a very protective role in the natural ecology. It forms itself around other plants and it produces a lot of these compounds these, these biological compounds, these chemical compounds that are consistent through all biological life. I mean, they're compatible. They're signals that are compatible through all biological life, plants, higher vertebrates, et cetera. But they're, they're, they're adaptive, they're stress adaptive, the entire stress adaptive matrix. Mm. They're meant to protect other plants from pests and other things. They're, they're, you know, they're you know, you know, protective against themselves. So they, they perform this highly protective essence. So whenever you take that plant and consume it, it transfers that sort of protective buffer to you, right? Right. Almost as right. like a biochemical shield that comes around you that helps you process and expel stress at every level. Physical, so cool. chemical, emotional, even psychologically, how it helps you reflect. It's sort of this it helps to process emotional stress as well too through chemistry. So that's a general philosophical explanation. We know through the literature that it hits on virtually every neuro and tissue protective mechanism that we know of, right? So like I said, this is plant pharmacology. It's not just one single compound that's one thing. It's all these things, but it has one essence. And the reason right. why it does all these things because it's protective across the board. So we know that it, it, it not only enhances GABA, which reduces glutamate levels, which is protective and downregulates limbic system, stress system, you know, better sleep, the whole thing. It's also a sodium and calcium channel blocker. So ion channels that lead to, you know, erratic overfiring and high glutamate levels and the thing that's, that's the mechanism that we know now is activated by EMFs, right? Is the, the influx of calcium in the cell um, through these voltage gated calcium channels. So it's a calcium channel blocker. So, you know, one of the things I had EMF sensitivity and when I started taking kava, that reduced it pretty drastically. I was able Fascinating. To I have several people with EMF sensitivity. That is brilliant. We will be using yeah. that. It was, it was like when I was, when I started kava, like I couldn't use the phone at all because I was so reactive to like, and I was able to, I was having even you know, you know trouble with my calls with with Dr. Pompa. We'd have to like split them up, and I'd I'd be like have to sit away from the computer. And wow, I never would have thought that was possible before. But anyways, so it's a sodium calcium channel blocker as well. We also know that it's a powerful NRF2 upregulator. Um, so through the antioxidant response element, it has this protective mechanism on reducing the oxidation. That's a byproduct of autoimmunity. It also is a COX1 and COX2 inhibitor, just like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, but without the kidney and liver toxicity mm. and all that stuff and the effects on the gut, uh, you know, obviously that happen. But then all these effects on AMPK is also a protective mechanism because, you know, turning over fat into ketones is an adaptive protective response, right? It's a protective okay. response through, you know, you know, for many reasons, obviously when food isn't present, it, you know, the body goes into the state where it, it does self-reflection and house cleaning where it automatically, to protect the body from long-term complications, it focuses its efforts to cleaning up bad senescent cells that are gonna cause problems later on so the system can work better. Um, it, it, it generates ketones, which are like protective in and of themselves, mm -hmm. which stabilize the mitochondria, which is why ketogenic diets are good for seizure disorders as well. They help to stabilize that whole process as well. Right. So it makes sense that this ketogenic aspect would be included in this continuum of neuroprotection. So cool. We do, you know, uh, my resetters, we do a fast training week once a, once a month where we take on different concepts of fasting. We just did one on anti-aging and I showed them all the different research on how fasting can slow the aging process down. And I've been thinking about doing a happiness one on uh, in October because there's some incredible research about how fasting will reset your dopamine receptor sites. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering now as you're talking, I'm like, I'm going to see if some of my resetters want to try the Kavaplex 
and put it into their fasting experience to see what kind of changes they see either in ketones or blood sugar or in their ability to go into longer fasts. I don't know if you've played around with that at all. Yes, we have. And uh, Dr. Pop and I actually did a small survey study with a you know, collection of different clients where we were just, you know, we had seen this in the population because we've been using a lot of time clinically you know, for a long time. And I've just you know, seen this with other doctors that have used it, my own personal experience, we see in the literature, the combination of all that. Um, but you know, we did a small like, you know, survey study where we had you know, a collection of uh, volunteers who like the effects of coffee on a fast, but they don't tolerate it well. It knocks them out, it spikes their blood glucose, gives them the jitters, all that stuff. So we wanted to see what happened um, you know, whenever we combine coffee with kava to see if it could reduce those effects. Right. Basically, we had them do three days of coffee, you know, measure their blood glucose before drinking the coffee and then 30 minutes after and then take down their blood glucose readings, right? And, and their symptoms, do they have jitteriness and all that stuff. And then we had them do three days where you added the kava flex oil to the coffee. And what we saw was on average over the entire number of people that we, we looked at, we saw an average reduction of 130% in average blood glucose readings, meaning that it, t it on average, it, neutral, it not only neutralized it, but dropped the blood glucose lower than baseline, right? Um, you know, you know, 30% lower. Wow. Um, so, so on average, it was, it was dropping blood glucose substantially um, or modulating it and, and you, know, you know, helping you know, you to push into the ketone state, possibly through multiple mechanisms, through blunting the cortisol spike that they would normally get from coffee because it opposes that but then also the ampk activation as well and stimulating ketone production and stuff so it, it it's you know there are multiple things fascinating oh, so I, I can't wait to try it on my resetters like and just see what what like get it out there and see what that what how it helps them yeah it's great it's amazing stuff so we developed the coliflex oil first which is the oil versatile it's the sort of what people start with you can put it in your coffee it's so synergistic with coffee because coffee already suppresses appetite and stuff and it's right. unique in its nature. It's also very synergistic with MCT because MCT helps with the bioavailability of the kava lactones and, and caffeine does as well. So MCT actually helps to, to shuttle the lactones through the gut barrier and through into the brain, the blood brain barrier as well. So you get a more rapid absorption of the effects when you so mix cool. with MCT and with caffeine. So if you put in your coffee, it'll hit you harder as well. And you just get this amazing synergy. It also adds that sort of like creative sort of extra nootropic boost to like that sort of great alpha state that kava takes you into instead of like a jittery activation of your mind. It's like that perfect, if you get the strain right, which the strain that we use is really balanced. So it's like a daytime-ish. Uh, I mean, you know, you can, you, you can take it either one, you know, daytime or nighttime. Yeah. Like yeah. Your sleep leads to a good sleep later on. But it, you know, it helps to get you into that alpha state where it, it you know generates a little bit more creative thing, and even with the subtlety of the complex, uh, as well as you know you know gives your brain some non uh, you know a non addictive dopamine spike, um, so it's not dependent on glucose to get you know a spike of dopamine into the brain, and obviously the you know the ketone production all that stuff that tends to happen there. Yeah, so, so fascinating. It, it, it's such an amazing tool. Like a lot of people yeah. like, like oh I've heard of Kava before, but no, because it, you know, because there's there's so many ways you can go wrong, and kava, you know, by doing this with you know the products that, that we're introducing into the market, we're essentially in, you know introducing an entirely new commodity into the marketplace because all of these other kava products, the definition of kava, true kava, why we call a company true kava, is because the definition of true kava in the islands is the water and pressure traditional extracted drink or substance from the roots of Piper methysticum. So you have to only be using the roots, which a lot of products don't, and the the uh, the leaves and stems have actually real toxins in them, and that can mm -hmm. lead to some issues. Um, and then they're extracted with solvents, alcohol, because you get a high yield and it's cheap and all this stuff. That's what all the products are virtually. And so they they're no more kava than a caffeine pill is coffee, or you know, it, they're actually caffeine pill at least gives you a lot of the effects with with side effects. Um, so. This is something that's very different. And whenever it's in this form, like the traditional people use it, um, it just has this just, it's this, this amazing level of relevance to this time. Mm. It is not, in no way uh, are we saying that this is a magic bullet or anything like we discussed earlier, but it's a tremendous tool, an adjunct to anyone who's trying to build more resiliency. And it's a great leverage tool because a lot of times when we're in a traumatic, you know, traumatized state, like so many of us are in 2020, yeah. welcome to you know, 2020. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> you know, stress is very paralyzing. 
So sometimes if you can have an intervention that's safe, that can help sort of bring that weight off your shoulders, then you actually have the ability to, to go out of that state of paralysis and introspectively start to work on your life at these upstream levels, right? So, um, you know, and so that's why I put Kava in a category that I call safe crutches, right? Mm. Most drugs now call their crutches, but they're not safe crutches. They're, they cause more problems than they solve most of the time, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you just try, you know, if you have an anxiety, you know, perpetual anxiety, try drinking every day, see where that takes you, right? It's like, right. <laughs> Uh, no, that's bad. A slippery slope. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. just really not yeah. it's a bad strategy because you'll end up in a worse place than you started. Yeah. Um, I mean, every once in a while or use, but, but I'm saying like, if you're actually using like as a medication. Yeah. Not good. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, so cool. That's... Well, what you created is amazing. And you now have my wheels spinning on how we can use it uh, with our community. And, you know, I have so many women going through menopause that are applying the principles of fasting and the ketogenic diet. And so a tool like this could be incredible. So let me finish up with this. I have five questions for you. I like to finish, I like to like, uh, finish up with sort of a rapid fire of five questions. Um, I, I knew a little bit of your story before, but I definitely didn't know it at that level. So if you could go back and talk to the 19 year old version of you and give him some advice, what would you tell him? I would say that the road to success is paved with bricks of failure. That failure is ultimately not a bad thing if one is focused and vigilant off of using failure as a stepping stone towards success. That every failure is absolutely an opportunity. Um, that it's like that old, you know, you know, you know, saying about Thomas Edison. I don't know if it's true or not. Where you know, it took him a thousand tries to come up with the um, the incandescent filament-based light bulb and you know, and, and, you know, someone said to him, oh my gosh, you failed, uh, you know, almost a thousand times. I didn't fail. I developed 999 ways how not to make a light bulb. I only need to find one way to make it work. And those 999 ways taught me how to make the one way, right? Beautiful. That's a very important thing that, you know, I, I would always tell, you know, younger people and would definitely tell myself, fail hard, fail early, but be be inspired and ha and you know develop and be vigilant to a sense be, you know connect yourself with a sense of meaning and you know and purpose because the other thing that i would say to myself besides you know that failure is is a crucial part of development is don't pursue happiness pursue meaning right mm. uh, you know so you don't pursue I, what i mean true happiness actually oh, i love that that's fulfillment, true happiness. Yep. Right? It comes through meaning and the adoption of responsibility and uh, obtaining, doing really hard things and growing and giving. But don't pursue pleasure, basically, what a lot of people think happiness is, right? Don't pursue pleasure, yep. don't pursue feeling good, but pursue meaning because w you know, when I was for 10 years in a state of absolute torture on a second to second basis, I got to a point where I was happier, more fulfilled than I ever was in my entire life before I ever got sick, sick because I had a sense of purpose, because I had mm. meaning, right? Mm -hmm. So you can, you can weather any storm if you find that meaning inside yourself and you find a higher purpose, something to work towards. And even during, and, and you know, eventually your life will get better and you'll have pleasure as a byproduct. Yeah, so but, true. But, um, but that's not what needs to be pursued. Yeah, that's so not true. the best result. So that's what oh, I want to tell Great advice. I'm gonna have my kids listen to that one. That was good advice. Okay, uh, second question. What do you think has been the hardest part of your healing journey? I would say for me, um, the most difficult part has been just finding a good, a good balance of regulating, um, you know, once I get into, you know, helping myself or helping others, you, the hardest part for me is staying grounded and practical. And because I have one of these sort of yang personalities where I want to just push, push, push. And once I get in, I find an answer. I want to help everybody. And I want yep. to do things to I everybody hear and stuff. And, but there's that practical, grounded, rational sense of like, okay, realistic, right? I've got the vision. Now I have to, I have to ground it and I have to integrate it into a frame that's realistic and practical, right? And so for me, that's the biggest challenge is you go far down the rabbit hole with any of these things or far into a healing process. You're sitting on a gold mine of experience and anyone who goes through a profound healing process is. But that, that realism, that practicality, that sort of 
framework of, of actually executing something that really, really is successful, that's a whole nother skill in and of itself. And so that was the most difficult and is the, the process for me of figuring out, okay, got a, you know, a bunch of ideas here. How do we build the infrastructure to execute to the highest level of return on my investment of time, right? Mm -hmm. and modulating my time correctly. And that goes yep. into it as well too. So that, that has been the biggest challenge for me, something that I always work on, but it's an important piece. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, what do you think has been the most rewarding part of your healing journey? The most rewarding part of my healing journey, hands down, is anything that I get to pass on to other people, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there are two sources, I believe, for, you know, you know, for happiness. And I think the social sciences really outline this very well. And that's very simple. It's growing and giving, right? If you're not growing, if you're stagnant, then you're not going to be happy. You're not going to be fulfilled. If you're going into escapism or drugs or whatever you're doing in your life, and you're not progressing, then you're going to never be fulfilled, right? Yep. But, you know, so, so growing will make you happy. Giving will make you even happier. And That's I believe so we're meant to grow so that we can give because you can't give what you don't have, right? Yep. So we're meant to grow to be able to cultivate abundance so that we have something to give. When I was bankrupt, sick, in poverty, in $100,000 in debt, whatever, I had nothing to give anyone, no matter how much I wanted to, and therefore I would never have any sense of like fulfillment because I was so bankrupt on myself. Right. So that is an extremely, the most rewarding point for me, the destination is growing to the point, building abundance to where I have something to offer people in the world. Oh, I love that. I love that. Okay. What do you think's the most misunderstood thing about Kava? Most misunderstood thing about Kava is the safety and the efficacy, right? You know, those two things actually, the safety is probably the most misunderstood thing because if you get these quality control issues wrong, if you don't use 100% root material, you end up with the, the leaves and stems that are beautiful, heart-shaped, amazing looking, but they have very powerful plant defense toxins, not even like the ones that are in the roots of the wild forms. Mm. Um, and those can actually be toxic to the liver. If you then extract them with chemical solvents and denature them, you concentrate those toxins and you can actually hurt people um, which happened in the early 2000s, there was a, 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 a collection of people, very small, it was like a few dozen people that got hurt from one pharmaceutical product that was not real kava at all, it was had contamination. So now there's this thing that's circulating around about liver toxicity and kava. I saw that. The WHO and, and the scientific community have totally overturned every country that had a kava ban has lifted it or in the process of lifting it. But you know, once it's out there, it's still, you know, people still say it. I yeah. still have people say it to me. So that's the biggest misconception is that is Kava safe and, oh, it doesn't do anything. I've tried it because I tried this stuff at the health food store. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Last question. If you had one message for the world, if you could get one concept in every person's brain on the planet, what would it be? Yeah. You know, I would, I always go back to, you know, you, <laughs> you people are looking for answers in this time, right? You know, there's, there's more you know, disorientation and confusion and chaos in the world. And people need more than anything, a direction. They need a sense of meaning. They need a sense of purpose because that is the antidote to depression, right? You know, like I said, no matter how much you're suffering physically, psychologically, emotionally, if you have a sense of meaning, if you're doing something, so overcoming obstacles and you're in your, and you have a sense of meaning where you're giving something, if you're growing and you're giving and all the things that we just named, then you're going to be fulfilled as a human being. And, and collectively, if we all get there or enough of us get there, then you know, the species evolves in a very positive way and problems tend to go away. We cultivate health at every level, physically, psychologically, emotionally. And we tend to just like the cells in the human body when we get them all on the same page and communicating and, and locked into their actual sense of purpose, which is like modulated through signaling. Uh, you know, whenever you remedy all that by allowing them to communicate, um, then they tend to, you know, you know, sort of reform to a state of like synergy and health, right? Homeostasis, right? So I think that, you know, people are looking right now for a sense of meaning and they're looking for whys. And I would say, find your why and find that through pursuing meaning and not pursuing happiness, not pursuing what's going to make you feel good right now, but what's going to give you a deep sense of meaning, what's going to really do that for you. 
um, that's, that's what I would say. Oh, amazing. Well, Cameron, this was an incredible delight. I do have to say about halfway through, I was like, I should have taken some Kavaplex before I came to this. Oh, yeah. As you were like describing all the different things that it does, I'm like, I get, because the way you put your words together, I'm like, that was a really good point. And now I'm thinking, oh, it's because he took some Kavaplex before he hopped on here. <laughs>